combination of a lived experience with research, the data, plus compelling humor will make you stand out as a creator. We've lost how special it is that we get to connect with the world. It's like, what do you do when you can say anything? And so we tell people, what is that thing you can't help but say? That's what it takes to become a content creator. You've got to just start. You can't wait to have the right gear. Use the gear you have. You just have to have the right content. And if you're diligent, consistent in that, you will win over time. Your channel grew 100,000 subscribers in six months. What do you attribute it that to? How many uploads a week? And let's kind of break down the whole process. Welcome back to the Thick Media Podcast. I'm super fired up because in this episode, we're going to be talking about 100,000 subscribers in six months. And this is George Camel, Ramsey personality, revealing everything that he's learned, a little bit about his story and some tactics that you can apply for growing your channel and creating incredible content. But let me ask you, George, what is one practical tip you've learned about some of your best performing videos that people can apply to get better results on YouTube? Ooh. That's a good one. The one practical tip, it may sound it may sound like the thing we've all heard before, but I think there's being yourself is so underrated. When you get on camera, it is so hard to not become sort of a character of yourself. And I still struggle with that, but I think every video that's done well and a moment that really connected was just when I wanted to deliver value from an authentic place with my true personality. Those are my favorite videos. It's the ones that don't drain you, but they actually give you energy. And when it comes to being your authentic self, did that come natural or in your early videos, was it hard to kind of figure that out? I think we've dialed it in. I have a wide range of, you know, I'm kind of a chameleon. And so on The Ramsey Show, it's not the YouTube channel. It's not the slapstick, fun, humor, you know, pop culture. It's a lot more like a detective on The Ramsey Show. You're just sort of listening intently, asking pointed questions. Whereas YouTube, we own it. We, we did the script. Now it's time to deliver the script and kind of perform the script, if you will. And Smart Money Happy Hour, the other show I do with Rachel Cruz, it's hair down. We're just goofing off. It's my truest self because I'm not reading off of something in that sense. So I think YouTube took a while to get dialed in, but it's a mix. Of, it's a dance with the editing team because of how integral it all is. It's not just about my performances. How does this interact with all of the other things that they're going to see in the end product? So your channel, so you're a Ramsey personality, but your channel, which is your first and last name, grew 100,000 subscribers in six months. What do you attribute it that to? How many uploads a week? And let's kind of break down the whole process. I think a lot of the work comes before you ever launch the channel. Mm -hmm. A lot of people just sort of launch and then figure it out. And that's a strategy. But at Ramsey, we have a big team here, a lot of resources and there's processes. And so we followed a, a pipeline process that we developed for our any show that we do. And so that took a lot of steps just to go through you know, testing and research and who's the, what's the problem? What's the persona? Who are we going after? And so we finally realized, okay, we want to go after this guy named Sam, a fictional guy named Sam. He's 26. He graduated college. He's making some decent money, but he's like, what do I do now? I've got some debt. I want to build wealth. How do I do all of this? So that gave us a very specific picture. So when I look into the camera, I'm not looking at the black lens of doom. I'm looking at Sam. And that helps me connect deeper with that audience. And that helped us create a channel that right out the gate, we knew exactly what people were wanting. And we knew what the other creators were doing in that space. And we knew what made us different. So I was like, I want to educate the Ramsey way in for a new generation with a lot of humor. And we nailed that out the gate. And it took time to go, what content is connecting? What's not connecting? And so pretty soon on, we realized... They love to hear about 401ks and wealth. They love to hear about frugal people and the habits. And they love the millionaires and cars getting coffee. And so it became a testing ground. And then we lean into whatever's working. And how many uploads a week roughly on your channel? We started and we still maintain three uploads every single week. And my show is more complicated than other shows because it's a very tight, defined script with a little bit of ad-libbing. But other shows, they're caller driven So you're just sort of reacting to a caller or kind of riffing on a segment. Ours are very dialed in with a lot of research, a lot of teaching, and a lot of planned jokes. So that takes more time. And so three shows a week was a huge lift that I was honestly worried about going into it. So walk me through the process. Who's at the genesis of ideation? Do you try to come up with title first, topic first? So what we do, we have an air table. And so the team will submit ideas during the week as something comes to them. 
And then we go through the Airtable in a content meeting and we'll walk through them. We'll talk about the description and go, yeah, I like that. Or, oh, we could use that for that. And what if we did this here? And we start to tweak the ideas. And then at the end, we sort of have a group vote and go, yes, let's do that content. So out of that content meeting, we'll come up with the, the three or four next episodes and our producer will plot them as far as scheduling and prioritization, then the next meeting will become a, a scripting meeting where we actually flesh out those content ideas with a writer. And so that's when I'll go, hey, here's the five, if we're gonna do five tips, here's the five tips I want for this frugality video. We're doing one called uh, 12 Frugal Rules for Life. So I had to come up with what are the 12 frugal rules. And so that's where we'd come up with the scripting. I'd give them a rough idea. They run off and write for the week. And then we come back to a read through. And that's where I really, dive into the script, start making tweaks. I literally read every word that I'm gonna say out loud to make sure I can say it. And you, you don't realize the stuff you'll stumble over as a communicator until you say it out loud. And I always wanna make sure uh, I have humor in there. So we'll highlight anything in humor gets highlighted in orange. And if I don't see orange for a while, I get nervous and we go, well, guys, we have to have some humor in there to keep the ball in the air. And so after the read through, it's ready for the prompter. And so then I show up for a recording and we'll knock out you know, four episodes in a row. So you do the heavy lift as far as the tips, the strategy, and then a writer who I imagine is kind of an extension of your brand voice helps flush that out. This helps you increase the volume of content. Exactly. Because I'm, you know, I wish I was just doing this 40 hours a week, but this is one thing I do out of 12. We're doing media interviews like this. We're traveling at live events. I'm hosting the Ramsey Show for three hours multiple times a week. I've got Smart Money Happy Hour, other team meetings, one-on-ones. And so it's it's a lot on our plate. And so luckily we have amazing resources here and an incredibly talented team that pulls this all off. So I'm not sitting there later with the edit. I record and then I leave it to the team to handle the rest. So then your ability to do multiple shows like Smart Money Happy Hour or the Ramsey Show is less prep or almost no prep? Very little prep compared to this. This is the most prep I do is for this show. Ramsey show, you don't know what call you're gonna get. And yeah. so we show up, you know, we have a content meeting of like some planned content we wanna try in the show. Smart Money Happy Hour, we have a content meeting and we'll do kind of a read through. But Smart Money Happy Hour, we're going off of a outline with a with a light script, but it's really us just riffing off of it. This one is very different where we, we try to nail what's in the prompter. So. That Smart Money Happy Hour would be more of like what you'd call a video podcast. It yes. gets distributed on audio, of course, on YouTube. And what is the light planning that goes into that? And then it's you and Rachel Cruz? Yes. So you have two people. So if somebody was listening to this and they wanted to do like a show with a friend or a partner and they wanted to kind of follow that model for whatever niche, it's lighter. It's a lighter lift and it's more live. It's more reaction, like and lots of conversational podcasts out there. So when you say there is some prep, what kind of prep? For us, we have the content meeting where Rachel and I green light and go, yes, we're excited about this. Here's the angles we could take it. There's writers in that room as well and producers. And then the writers for that show take that run with it and create maybe a four or five page kind of outline script of here's where we're going to go. And we could read it verbatim, but we we try to kind of go off script a lot. And there's always a hilarious moment that it was not planned for in the script. Like Rachel once said, Al, instead of AI. So that became a whole bit, you know, it's like, yeah. we didn't, we can't plan for that. Yeah. And so that one is much more imp improvised versus uh, the YouTube channel, which hopefully in the performance, there's some improvised moments because I love that. Um, but Smart Money Happy Hour is largely, I'll read it over for 20, 30 minutes. And that's as much prep as I put into it. Got you. And so a common theme here, though, it's interesting, you know, I know, uh, I think you and Graham Stephan collaborated and he just recently was on our show. He scripts his videos word for word. Oh, yeah. His and process is wild. His process is wild. And I think a lot of people are like shooting from the hip on YouTube, but he spends a whole day just writing, just writing script. his script. Eight hours. Yeah, he spends eight hours writing his script. And so competition is highest for mediocre content. And I think also competition is higher, f highest for low effort content. So it's interesting, you're the fastest growing show in Ramsey history, but it takes a ton of energy that goes into that. And not only scripting, but also inserting humor. What has been kind of the principles you've learned here when it comes to pillars of powerful communication? Ramsey is known for that, that you think is a common theme between the content that might happen on YouTube, but also on stage and even in two books. Like you guys are master communicators. What are some yeah. of those pillars? Well, you have to be compelling. 
if you're not compelling, there's a lot of people who are delivering dry financial content and they'll find their niche. It's not saying they won't be successful, but what we found is what makes us different is that we're passionate about the content. It's not just information that we're gonna regurgitate or give you the spark notes of. We are living these principles out. These are living, breathing principles. We're actually living without a credit card and we're yeah. showing you how it's done. And so none of it is theoretical in a sense. So the my favorite content is when I get to actually do the thing instead of telling you. And so an example, Instead of telling you you can rent a car with a debit card without a credit card, I called five rental places and you hear the conversation. You hear my conversation with them. That to me is the most powerful. It's the show, don't tell content. And so that's compelling from a communication standpoint. Humor is a big thing. I mean, we take for granted how funny Dave is, how entertaining he is. A lot of financial people out there have been doing this a long time, but goodness, they are a snooze fest. Yeah. And so what Dave brings to the table is a passionate entertainment born out of principles and values. And then on top of that, is the information good? Is this, you know, is it well researched? And that's another thing we bring to the table. I always try to come to the table with stats and research and not just my opinion, not just my lived experience. And I think the combination of a lived experience with research, the data, plus compelling humor will make you stand out as a creator. I think that lived experience piece is underrated in the creator economy, mm -hmm. meaning a lot, I think there's a, there's a gap between what some people are saying and showing online and what they're actually living. And you saying, no, we're actually living without credit cards. You know, I was talking to team members here, we're at Ramsey Studios and they're like, well, there might be a few people that may like that are, but really if you had a credit card, you'd be out of alignment with the actual mission here. Like, Over time, you're just gonna self-select out and be like, I don't wanna work here. Yeah. We're like, why are you here? And and it, it is it is a actual lifestyle that y'all are living. You're living the baby st steps, it feels like, from the front desk to the camera. But you've also had a chance to do like different influencer events. You guys have hosted some, you've collaborated with all kinds of people. Have you seen that? Do you feel like there's a gap that you've noticed between maybe what people are showing on so social media and what they're living? Oh, 100%. And it's, it's sort of the BS stuff that I try to call out because I'm tired of people being like, here's how to grow from zero to a million when this guy hasn't even done it. Yeah. And so, just like your story, you've lived this out. This is not a theoretical right. example. And I think that's what people end up gravitating toward is the guy who actually did it versus the guy who shows you that it's you could do it if you follow these steps. And a lot of the TikTokers out there, you'll get some initial clicks, but if you wanna create a tribe like Seth Godin talks about, people wanna know that you're actually worth your salt and that you walk the talk. And that's, I think, what Ramsey brings to the table is that we're not, we're practitioners of what we teach. What are some, um tools, Airtable you mentioned, is there anything else that you use maybe doing research if you're researching news to bring some headlines in for outlines? What are just some of the things that you guys use in your workflow? Um, our team will bring kind of articles and so we'll use, you know, like Apple News to source some of that stuff. Our publicity team is sending a daily headlines to a whole swath of people. And so we'll go, hey, what's in the headlines today? What's trending? That's a helpful tool as well. Our team uses uh, Jira to move, we use cards to move from like step to step to step in the process for a video edit, for example. So Airtable and Jira are huge. We use Teams to communicate. A lot of people use Slack. And so that's a our communication tool largely is over Teams. We're in person, so we don't do a lot of like Zoom type calls unless someone's homesick, for example. But other than that, that's, that's all, really all it is. We're very big into in-person collaboration. And so we meet physically in person to do most of the work. And so other than teamsing, hey, I'll send you that article. Hey, here's a resource. Hey, grab that piece from my book, that chapter on credit cards. Let's use this blurb. And so there's a lot of just, as the authority and expert, I'm always thinking about where can I pull all this from? Maybe it's a Ramsey blog we use as a framework. So the Ramsey blog is such a huge resource that I utilize to go, how do I take all these words that a writer worked hard on to then bring them to life in a YouTube video and make it feel modern and relevant. That's a powerful tip because I think even if you're a solo creator, there's you're sitting on more content than you realize. And it could be that blog or that thing you wrote or even that thing you wrote. You already did the heavy lift a year and a half ago. And if you added some fresh examples and yeah. some things like that. So the idea, and for people who have been 
blogging to move to video podcast or to move to YouTube. Maybe you've written long form social media captions. You've done heavy lifting on other places that could turn into video. That's super smart to take Ramsey blogs and then yeah. say, there's the heavy lift. And, and you don't have to always start from scratch. A lot of people like you get stuck in that creative rut when you're just like, what, what video should I make today? And so I love to just, I'll go and I'll scroll social media and see what are people sending me in the DMs. I get so many videos every day of like, yeah. did you see this reel? And do you think this is true? You've sent me some stuff. And that inspires me. So I'll send that to the producer and say, hey, we should look into this and make a video based on this content idea. Yeah. So. I, I sent you that one where they said, uh, you need to develop character. And one of the, and, but if you haven't gone through hardship, here's some advice. Run up your credit card. <laughs> yes. Like go into debt on purpose. Go into debt on purpose to <laughs> cause yourself hardship so that you develop. I was like, bro, you got to react that's to this. I don't know if you did, yes. but uh, that's some bad advice. It was, but uh, I get the humor. Hopefully people understood it was humor, yeah. satire, right. if you will. Right. So funny. So what's your story of becoming a Ramsey personality? Like you've been doing this just for like a couple of years, but yeah. you go back. When did you first get connected with this whole movement. Would you like a free copy of the number one best-selling book for growing a successful YouTube channel? If you wanna get a copy of the new and expanded second edition of YouTube Secrets, just go to ytsecrets.com. And if you'll cover shipping and handling, I would love to send you this book for free. And the cool thing is when you place your order, you're also gonna get access to some bonus resources like our 1000 subscribers club, our seven C's framework, our perfect video recipe framework, work, as well as some bonus videos that will help you get results on YouTube faster. So to get your copy, just go to ytsecrets.com or click the link in the podcast show notes. Yeah, I will come, I'm will. i coming up on 11 years here in a, in a week, which is so wild. And so I started here as an intern. I, I came out of the world of being one of those random creative guys who was like, I'm a musician and I'm gonna start a band, but I'm also into video. So I almost went to film school. So I started uh, using, what was it at the time? Final Cut 7 yeah. in high school and in my video class. And I thought I'm gonna be a videographer. That's gonna be my thing. And so I got into Emerson in Boston, which is an amazing film and media school. And then I found out it was gonna be 50 grand a year. So I was like, I'm gonna go 200 grand into debt for a film degree. Yeah. Maybe I should pause. So I ended up going to a state school, meandered around, was in a band, worked at the Apple store, got fired from the Apple store, thought my life was over, worked at Urban Outfitters, moved south, finished a, a, a tiny t private Christian school called University of Mobile with a bachelor's of science in communication. And from there, it was like, what next? I was into social media and technology and marketing. And so I got a gig here at Ramsey as an intern for a personality mm -hmm. doing social media. Wow. So that was my first foot in the door at Ramsey, and that turned into a full-time job in email marketing for two and a half years, into social media for personalities for a year, into helping another personality with email and social for a year. That turned into a hosting role, taking over for our friend Ken Coleman. Mm. So did you find those formative years helped you become the communicator you are today? Oh, 100%. Number one, I knew this place like the back of my hand, the relationships I had forged, the way I had embodied the principles. Because over the last 11 years, I've had 11 years to live these principles out and really put them to the test. And so my story was, I started here as a broke 23-year-old intern with $40,000 in debt, 36,000 in student loans, $4,000 in credit card debt, went through Financial Peace University, got rid of that debt in 18 months, met my wife here, who still works here today, and we lived out this plan. And I went from broke to now we're net worth millionaires 10 years later, and hosting is what gave me the reps. So taking over for Ken for four years, I was hosting all of our live events, hosting all of the breaks on the video channel for the Ramsey Show, and that gave me so many reps. When you're on camera every day, multiple times, on stages, having to improvise, having to pivot, now, in the YouTube studio, now it's just like the back of my hand. But that took years of practice. And even then, I was a musician early. So I was at 14 years old playing in a Starbucks, you know, with hecklers, and you're learning how to deal with that. And so I've always enjoyed being in front of people, performing, entertaining. But now I get to do it with a mission that I'm really proud of, that I want to see other people live out. Do you think on social media, there's this message of like, let's blow up overnight, and there's this rush, it's this get rich quick, it's get famous quick. Do you think it's underrated or maybe even necessary to go through, like to be now that you have a platform, like 
can you imagine if you if you didn't go through those formative years? You think it could be oh, dangerous? Oh man, I think it would be very toxic because you want to just like hit the viral button every day, and if you don't succeed, you just think you're a failure as a person. And so we put so much stock, and most people are like, if I'm going to start that podcast, like. I better get this many views or else I'll quit. I'm like, well, then don't start the podcast. If that's your measuring stick, like start the podcast because you can't help but talk about this. Mm -hmm. You can't help but talk about content creation and videos and make videos, whether anyone sees it or not. Those are the people I want to follow, not the guy who's hoping he says the right thing to get a click that day. And I grew up on YouTube. I had a YouTube channel in 07 where I was uploading covers. Yeah. I did a cover of like um, uh, Rihanna's Umbrella. Yes. I was doing like dashboard confessional covers. Come on. And I was getting like, I would get like 180,000 views and I was like, holy crap. Yeah. Like I can, on my iMac with I'm my famous. iSight camera, I can just record a song, hit publish, and all these people around the world will get to see this. Like that blew my mind. Using GarageBand and iMovie, I could create this. Wow. So, like, that was a special time as a creator. You remember those days. You were much yeah. fancier than I was back then. Yeah. But I think we, we take for granted now because now I just can record on my phone. Everything's sort of content. You're on Instagram story. We've lost how special it is that we get to connect with the world with whatever we want to do on a daily basis. And I think it's become scary because it's overwhelming now. It's like, what do you do when you can say anything? And so we tell people... What is that thing you can't help but say? That's what it takes to become a Ramsey personality, and I think that's what it takes to become a content creator. If somebody has a W-2 right now, but they want to start expressing, you know, maybe starting a side hustle, maybe to earn extra income, if they're starting from that mission-driven place, it's because they also want to share their voice, and they would say it no matter what views they have. Do you have any advice or thoughts on, on starting a side hustle to create extra income? Maybe even pros and cons that you would see. Oh yeah, well we get that call a lot on the Ramsey Show and people are like, hey, I wanna start this YouTube channel and I'm a W2 employee, I'm trying to pay off debt. We go, well, that's a really terrible way to pay off debt in the next month. In the next month thinking, for sure. You know what I mean? Like it's in a great long-term goal. Yeah. And so if you, if you need money to pay off debt, that's a different story than I'm doing this because I wanna turn this hobby into a full-time thing. And so the people who do it right are the ones who take the full-time job, then as soon as they get home, nights and weekends, over lunch, they're hustling to build this side thing up. And once they do that and they start seeing some meaningful revenue, then you can easily see, hey, if I put 40 hours into this, I could replace my income. And so that's when it's time, instead of a leap of faith, you're just taking a step off the dock into that boat and it should feel seamless. It should be a little bit scary, but it shouldn't be frightening. That's where I go, okay, there's actual risk here. And as you get older and you start having family and kids and a wife, there's just more risk. You know, like starting today, if you had your two kids and your wife, it's a little riskier to go like, I'm just going to try to be a YouTuber, you know, yeah. and you have to be all in no matter what. And so go slow and naturally you'll find the path to go. I know it's time for me to go. That's pretty good. Break that down. Like if you thought about different seasons of life and how much, how much risk you should take on with a side hustle. So what's the difference between a, a 21 year old, no kids, single and 31 with a wife and three kids? What would be your framework for decision making? Well, one of the decisions is how little can you live on? How much are you willing to sacrifice your current lifestyle if you really want this end goal? That tells me a lot. Because if you're blowing money on your lifestyle while telling me that you really want to build a side hustle, I just simply don't believe you. But when you're willing to like, I will, I'll get four roommates if I have to, because this dream means that much to me so that I can put this time and money into this thing. That's when I think that person succeeds. Mm -hmm. And I think we love the comfort of like, well, I still want to eat out every weekend and go out with my friends. The creators that I find that win are so dialed in and focused that it's almost an obsession. It's almost like I can't help but I want to go home and go create something. And, and as soon as it feels like a job, you've kind of lost. When it's like, oh, I gotta go home make another video. Well, you're gonna get burnt out about a week later if that's your mentality. So for the 22 year old who's single, you have so much number one time, but you also have a higher risk tolerance because no one's depending on your income. You can live on very little. And so I think that's a great time to do it. But if you're 31 with a family, I still don't want you to lose hope, but you also need to go, how are we gonna feed this family? And so that's where a budget comes into play. If you can go, hey, we can survive off of her income for this season while I get this thing off the ground, that's a great spot to be. But again, there's some serious risk when it's, Sean's not gonna make any money this month and we still have a mortgage to pay. Yeah. And so that's where becoming debt-free and having the emergency fund is such a 
more peaceful place to launch that side hustle versus when I'm drowning in debt and this side hustle better, you know, catapult me out of the situation. There's just too much you're putting on that. So good. Uh, if we go back now, you shoot these three videos, they get edited, they get uploaded. Where's packaging? How do thumbnails come into the process? Are you influencing those? Uh, I used to early on until we got them kind of dialed in. And now we have a team, there's a titling and thumbnail meeting that happens every single week that if I can be a part of, I try to join. But largely it happens without me. And it's usually better because of that. And now I just see it when it's out. Like I get excited. I'm like, oh man, they crushed it on that one. That's great. Yeah. And now we've been A-B testing thumbnails, which is a cool feature. And so not only do we, we don't have to just hope, we can now design two or three and there's a clear winner that we end up going with. So the team does a great job of taking the content and going, what is not, because I, I hate clickbait. I'm not a fan of the like gloom and doom, the super negativity, but what is a fun angle to actually convince you to watch a video about 401ks? Because if it was just like what you need to know about 401ks, no one's going to care about that. And so you have to add a level of weight to it, a level of hookiness where you still pay it off. So that's always our A1 is do we actually pay off the title? Is the thumbnail just out there to be out there or is it fun but also pays off watching the video? And so we always try to tie something in the thumbnail to the video and it's been working really well and we've gotten better at it over time and uh, we've realized nothing is fatal. And over time, the trust gets built to where regardless of the title and thumbnail, the people that love you are going to watch anyways. And the new people hopefully get drawn in with the title and thumbnail. But it's hard for us. We are like the not sexy financial advice on the internet. Yeah. Everyone else is telling me how to get rich quick. I can't make videos called get rich slow. Yeah. Follow my plan. Sure. Very few people are going to click on that. So we have an even harder time coming up with the hooky title because our advice is God's and grandma's ways of handling money. It's common sense. Yeah. You know, people are like, here's the top five cards to maximize. And I'm like, here's eight reasons to cut up your credit card. Yeah. Nobody wants to click on my video. Yeah. So we have to come up with interesting ways to frame them up. Interesting. Do you think you've ever gone too far and stepped into clickbait? Oh man. There's been times where I, I have a check in my spirit and I'll go to the team and be like, Hey, I don't really love the way this pains me, or here's what I think will happen if we publish this. And here's what I know the comments are going to say. And so I, I want to be above reproach. And sometimes I'm happy to be proven wrong. And truthfully, there, there's a level of give and take where I have to compromise and go, it's not what I would choose, but I trust this team that has paid well to do these things. And at some point I have to let go and say, if this is what's going to get people to actually consume the content that we worked hard to create, so be it. And until we get patterns of that feedback, I let my hands off the wheel and I go, all right, unless we see seven videos in a row where the comments are saying, hey, this is clickbait, we're not going to make any sweeping changes. And that's happened with uh, video clips because our team is big on putting culturally relevant memes and clips to kind of, you know, pop in in between a sentence. I don't know what they're going to put in there, but I just trust that it's going to be a tasteful amount and a tasteful clip. And there's been moments where I told the team, hey, guys, we need to dial it back. I'm seeing a pattern of comments. People saying, hey, it's distracting. I'm trying to engage with the content. But then there's also people who are like, that was a hilarious clip. I didn't know you were a fan of XYZ. And I'm like, oh, I don't I don't even know that movie reference, but I'm glad I come across as relevant. And so it's, it's largely due to our team working really hard to tastefully work on all this, the review stages, all of that stuff that I've now gotten more hands off on, more delegation. And when putting your videos out there for a couple of years, Ramsey show, your own show, you get negative comments? Oh my gosh, probably more than, I'm not going to say any personality, but I feel like my comment section has the most vitriol Interesting. out of uh, anything we do here. And it's kind of because I, I'm a little punchy. I kind of fly in the face of a lot of the advice. I'm, I'm trying to take down the haters. I'm the most aggressive against the money traps out there. And so because of that, I feel like I get more flack than most. And I've been told I have a punchable face. Um, which it has not been punched yet. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. So, but I do think I was the troll. And so I think there's something about me that attracts the other trolls mm. as a former troll. Mm. You know, I was the guy who wanted to go in the comment section and just say something behind my digital keyboard warrior, you know, faceless account. That's interesting to say you were the troll and you're no longer a troll. I would hope so. Yeah. People may say I am. Why do you think, I mean, if you get into the empathetic perspective, what do you think is fueling trolls? Oh man, I changed a troll once and I still, it, like nothing fuels me more. Like I, I turned them around. Mm. And so I remember getting a comment on one of my original 
acoustic covers I uploaded in 2007, 2008, and I still remember the comment. It said, it was like on my Umbrella Rihanna video, and it said, you killed it, and not in a good way. And I still remember that. And uh, the other time was when I tweeted at Steve Martin, and he replied back, yeah. like the Steve Martin, yeah. legendary comedian and actor. And I was like, Steve Martin's out here with these weird Twitter threads, like a crazy old grandpa that you keep around out of pity. Sorry, bud. And he just tweets back, and you are the sad idiot child. And that's when I was like, oh, there's like real people behind these accounts. Wow. And so I commented back to one person on, the, on my YouTube, my recent comment section, and I realized that these people, they're going through something. They've been hurt, and this is the outlet they have chosen to try to let out some of this anger and frustration. They're not really mad at me. They're mad at their situation. They're mad at the reasons they are where they are and why they feel like they're not succeeding. And they see me as a person who's not there to help them, who is not there to give them hope, but is there to kind of rub it in their face or something. So I commented back to a guy, and he said – he messaged me privately, and he said, hey, man – I'm so sorry about that comment. Like, I responded with kindness, first of all. I was just, I think that's the, the real key. You take that high road and you show them, hey, I'm a real person and I see your comment and I'm not going to try to punch back. It kind of deflates the situation to where it's like it, you, you, the bully loses steam at that point. And so th they responded back and said, hey, I applied to be a personality and I didn't get the job. And then I saw you become a personality in recent years and it just made me angry. Wow. And so he was commenting out of that anger and frustration, not at me. I just became the next target. And that's what I see with a lot of people in the comment section. They disagree with Dave and they want to come at me and they want to have a financial spat. But I know there's people that need help. There's a single mom who's about to call the Ramsey show. And so I'm, I can't just give up because someone didn't like my financial advice once. I got a message last night. She's like, you gave this caller terrible advice. And I'm like, well, start your own show and be, give them better advice. Like, yeah. I'm doing my best. I'm a fallible human. We're going to mess up. And so the comment section, while I love to engage out of uh, pure, you know, maybe a, a dark curiosity <laughs> and joy, yeah. I see them as like, these are the people that like are giving us their unfiltered opinion on the internet. And I take it all with a grain of salt. Whether it's a great comment, very positive or negative, you're not as great as they say you are and you're not as terrible as they say you are. And that to me helps keep me in a grounded place of humility. At this point in your career, you seem cavalier, confident, casual, like- All the C's, like thank a, you. Yeah, I was trying to really, <laughs> you like that? Yeah. You seem like a duck, like things just, the water just rolls off your back. But do you feel the pressure? Do you feel pressure and overwhelm oh. at this place in your career? Stress? I think so. Yeah. I mean, there's always the underlying weight. Like John Deloney says, now that we do the Ramsey show, we've been doing it for a while. Like you feel like, well, my blood pressure doesn't change. Mm -hmm. But he's like, when I check my, you know, my little watch and it's like, oh shoot. Like when you, at 106, when the Ramsey show intro came on, like there's your body knows, your body's mm -hmm. keeping the score that millions are listening. This is live and on the internet forever. It's always in the back of my mind. And so while I feel that pressure, I also... There's an even greater, I wouldn't say a pressure, but there's an even greater joy in just going like, I can't believe I get to be the guy to do this. Like, I don't deserve this. The fact that I'm on the, these platforms blows my mind. The fact that hundreds of thousands of people want to watch these videos blows my mind. And the part that helps ground me is knowing that it's not just me. And so for a solo creator out there, I can't imagine what that's like. But I have a team of people at Ramsey who believe in this mission, believe in what I'm doing, working on this content. And so while I feel the pressure to give solid advice out of a place of humility and really help someone and add value to their day and their life and their financial journey, I don't feel like it's all on me. Uh, it's hard to take credit for anything at Ramsey because 48 people were involved. And so you can't be like, well, it was all me. That did. 98 people were involved in launching that YouTube video that launched this week. And so I think that helps me go, it's not all my credit, therefore it's not all, the weight's not all on me. But when you go out in the streets, like you know, you gotta live your life. Like you got a hot mic. And so that's how I've lived my life. Like you're not gonna catch me in the streets cussing. And if you see me at Costco, I'm gonna be nice and wave to you and have a conversation with you because I represent something bigger than me. Not only Ramsey, but God. I mean, as a person of faith, it's my testimony. Every day, how I live my life, what I say on camera, what I respond to in the comment section, it's a reflection of all of that. And so I feel that way, but you can't let it crush you. Otherwise, you're not going to be in this business very long. That's strong. 
So is it true that Dave pays all the personalities with Bitcoin? Imagine being in the room with some of today's top personal brands, video marketing experts, and online entrepreneurs. This year, you will have that chance at growwithvideolive.com. Grow With Video Live is the number one conference for building your personal brand and growing your business with online video. This year's speakers include Dave Ramsey, Pat Flynn, Shalene Johnson, the Think Media team, and many more. So go to growwithvideolive.com to get your ticket today. Is it true that Dave pays all the personalities with Bitcoin? Oh my gosh, that'd be incredible if that was the secret life hack. Oh man, I think... In an alternate universe, Dave would enjoy that because he's like, this is fake money anyway. So sure, I'll pay you in Bitcoin. But. So you mentioned money traps earlier. Um, how much crypto do you do you have? Oh, gosh. As much as I've come out, not against crypto, but just sort of flying in the face of the crypto, bro. Yeah. I wish I could say I have secretly like 17 Bitcoin and I got it early on. That would be nice. I own zero. Yeah. Um, and it's I have no... FOMO. And right now, as we're doing this recording, Bitcoin is like almost at a record high. And so yeah. all the all the, those folks are getting loud again. But I'm just very confident in my financial plan. And regardless of if I ever had a Bitcoin or not, I'm confident I'm going to build wealth on my terms and invest in things that I understand. And so I'm not mad at crypto. If you have some, I'm happy for you. I hope it does well. Yeah. But I found that there's enough things that give me anxiety in this life. And now having a little daughter, I'm like, listen, I got enough problems to worry about and enough things that I'm focused on. I can't be checking 24 seven as crypto goes up and down yeah. over the next several years. So it's probably here to stay. And maybe one day it'll be in a mutual fund in my 401k. And I'll be like, cool. But it's the same reason I'm not going to go all, I'm a t I love Tesla. I have a Tesla. I don't invest in Tesla single stock. It's just a part of a mutual fund that the S&P 500 decided was a worthy company to, to put in that benchmark. And so it's for the same reason. It's just too volatile. So you said money traps. What is like a, if you were to just pop, 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 what are some of the biggest money traps that you see, especially Ooh. pushed on YouTube? Oh gosh. I mean, anything in the get rich quick world, we've seen a lot of real estate traps, a lot of like, here's how to get nothing down on a real estate investment, uh, arbitrage, Airbnb arbitrage, where you don't even own the property and you're like renting it out, but then you list it on Airbnb, uh, house hacking. That's another big one where you're going to rent out, you know, the other rooms. Uh, there's a lot with buy now, pay later credit, even like how to beat the system with credit. Like you're going to do a, you're going to get, write a check from your credit card to yourself, but then invest that and then you'll make a spread even more than the interest. And I'm like, this is such a complicated way to exist. And so I unpack in Breaking Free from Broke, my new book, I the first two thirds are just unpacking the big money traps. And of course I cover auto loans, student loans, credit cards, credit scores, mortgages, investing traps, all of that just to help us go, let's get a baseline for financial literacy so we don't make these mistakes. Because I believe when we can just stay focused on the four things we need to do, then the other things, they'll come and go, those other trends. Yeah, congrats on the new book. It hit a chart. Yeah, we hit number one on Publishers Weekly, yeah. nonfiction, that was huge. That's amazing. And again, uh, turtle on a fence post moment where I'm like, you know the turtle didn't get there on its own. Without Dave's platform and with the amazing marketing on the team, like I worked my tail off for over a year to make a book that I was really proud of. But thanks to Dave's platform, the team, all of the talent that's here, that's why the book was number one. That's why we sold a bunch of copies. If I was on my own, I'd be happy to sell 100 copies. You know, when I was a musician and I launched an album, I was stoked that like 38 people donated to the Kickstarter yeah. to help make the album. Yeah. And so it's, it's different. I don't think you need to have that expectation you know, whether it's YouTube or something else, like we are blessed with this amazing platform from Dave. If I was on my own, sure, I'd own it all, but you you might grow a lot slower. And so there's a piece of that, you know, yeah. like a record label. You can be an independent artist and you might make it over time and still have, retain all of your ownership, or you could work with the label yeah. and get a cut of that and get propelled beyond where you could go. And so that's this is the route I've chosen. It doesn't mean it's the right way for everyone. I'm a W-2 guy and I'm happy about it. And I don't, I don't have any dreams of like being an entrepreneur. So well said. And uh, we'll of course link the book up in the show notes. And I think people should pick up your book because getting your money right, if you're, well, W-2 and side hustling, or if you want this to be your main hustle, man, what would be your advice for those that are trying to grow faster by just thinking I can leverage credit to do so? Oof. 
That hurts. I want to get a camera, build my studio, and maybe I'm also just starting. Like, I mean, yeah. what mindset? Because yeah, I want to just, I'm just going to, I, I could do it all right now. I, would, I could I do it in the next six months. Right I could just stack it up on my credit card. I could get there faster. Yeah. I remember that. Fast. I worked at the Apple store and every paycheck I would just blow with discounts that we'd get on gear. And it was like, well, I'll get this camera, I'll get this laptop. And then it became, I'll start this podcast when I get the right camera. And really that the root was just fear and doubt. I had a 60-page Google Doc about my plans for this podcast I was going to do. I had taglines. I had the marketing plan. I had the guest list. What I didn't have was an actual podcast. And I realized I like planning more than I like doing. It's like I want to plan the trip. Actually, doing the trip is less exciting for me. And so th- I realized if you're a creator out there trying to start, you've got to just start. You can't wait to have the right gear. Use the gear you have. Most of us now have a smartphone. We didn't have this luxury back in the day where we had 4K cameras sitting in the palm of our hand that we could literally edit on our phones. I mean, I have friends that are, all they do is TikTok. They make a great living holding the camera like this and just talking to it for 60 seconds a day. And so never think that you have to have the right gear. You just have to have the right content and hope the right people show up. And if you're diligent, consistent in that, you will win over time. And you could do it later. You can invest later, but you don't need all the fancy stuff at the start. Exactly. And then going into debt for it, it hurts my soul. Because we've seen businesses that take on debt to try to invest in the business. I'm going to take five grand and buy the right gear and put it on my credit card. I'll make it back. What happens when you don't? What happens when you pivoted and you still have this debt hanging around and now it's holding you back from that next thing? And so I've just rarely seen debt be a blessing in someone's life. And Dave started, you know, after going through bankruptcy and leveraging debt with real estate, he started running this business with cash. And it's been that way ever since. People don't believe it. They think that we have credit cards somewhere in the building. We have business debit cards here and we move at the speed of cash. We don't build a building unless we have the cash to move to the next phase of the project. And so I find it's a, it's a more peaceful way to live. And if you're a creator out there, do it at the speed of cash, even if it means you move slower, even if it means you sacrifice to get out of debt to then go f- cash flow that next piece of equipment. And there's always going to be a new shiny piece of gear that you think will change your life. But as you know, we, you know, some of the best content had nothing to do with the gear that was used. It was the person. It was the information. It was the compelling nature of the content and the way it was delivered versus, well, you know what camera was used for that? That's why. He had a great prime lens. That's why that video did great. Yeah. You know, MK, MKBHD. He's great because he's MKBHD. Yeah. While he has great equipment and all that, that's a part of his world. It's not why he became who he was. So don't think you're going to get a red camera and all of a sudden become the next big YouTuber. Did you buy an Apple Vision Pro? No. Gosh. And I'm an Apple fanboy. Like, I truly love Apple. I just don't. I see it as a novelty item right now. And that may change in the future. Yeah. I just don't see a use case. It's, I don't even own an iPad. I'm like, there's very specific use for an iPad. Yeah. And in my world, I don't know what I'd use it for regularly to justify that purchase. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel, I hope it becomes It's not on your wish list? Not you don't to want me, it for the, Christmas. The price point, I'm like, that's almost as much as I spent on my last car. Like that hurts my brain to go like I'm gonna put that into an item that's gonna sit around and my wife is gonna be like, I told you you weren't gonna use that. Yeah. And then I'll sell it on Facebook Marketplace for half of what I paid for it. Do you think people look cool wearing them in public? No, unless you're Casey Neistat. If I saw Casey Neistat in public, I'd be stoked. But yeah, there's a piece of it where like I already don't look cool in public. The last thing I want to do is add giant goggles to my face. Yeah. You know, do you own a pair? I don't. Okay. No, yeah, I'm not interested. Exactly. In no, uh, you didn't. But I. if anyone I, had a use case, I thought it'd be you. No, I kind of feel the same. I feel like it's kind of a novelty at this point and an like, expensive Yeah, one. like you could edit standing in your living room, like pointing at things, looking yeah. like a crazy person. But it's yeah. also just as easy to sit down at your desk with all of your screens and wow. still be in reality. So so you're 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 not really like a Gucci guy. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> not a Louis Vuitton guy. <laughs> I do like now I've been told I'm bougie, even bougier than Rachel. Really? But I think it's just pretentious. We need to separate the two. I'm not bougie. I'm just pretentious. About what? Um, I have high standards for, you know, little things in life. Coffee? Coffee. I won't drink from a Keurig. Yeah. You neither. I won't do it. And people go, well, you're, you're bougie. I'm like, no, I'm just pretentious. Oh, it's also, I mean. I'm not better than you. I just. You're better than want, I want better who, for you. No, you are, you are actually better There's a difference. than people that drink from a Keurig. Not only is that coffee low quality, how long has it been on the shelf? They ground Lord those beans six months ago? It just tastes like if you 
it's just burnt bean water getting spewn there 160 be, there miles per hour. There could be mold in there. Dave Asprey has his whole thing about how much oh, mold could be in coffee. Yeah. Now, I do own an espresso, which is a similar functionality. Wow. But I think it tastes better. But you're also like a local Nashville kind of hipster kind of. I'd say I'm hipster adjacent. Like, I don't go to the farmer's market as often as you'd think. And I refuse to buy local if it's cheaper at Costco. You're hipster you know I mean? adjacent. Yeah. Yeah. So you bring up Costco. You're a Costco connoisseur. Yeah. they've. I've been called. The Kirkland King. The Kirkland King or the Costco Cowboy, depending the on The Costco who's... Cowboy. Yeah. Why the unhealthy obsession with... what? Do you have head-to-toe uh, Kirkland attire? That feels like a big assumption. But yes, I have two. Two? So they made, they made like a, onesies? They made a sweatpant and a sweatshirt matching. So I've got them light gray and I have it blacked out. Do you have the slides? I have the slides to match. You wear those with socks? Uh, occasionally around the house. Now, truthfully, I don't wear it in public. Okay. But as soon as I get home today, I'll swap this for the Costco gear just out of comfort. But why not do uh, a show and bring it in and somehow tie it into like an episode? Have you thought about that? I've talked about Costco enough that I think it's time to just wear it on set. Yeah. But again, I think co- the reason why you asked what my obsession is. I think there's such a beauty in them skirting the norm of like name brand. Mm -hmm. And so Costco is one of the biggest name brands out there, but they're one of the biggest private label companies in existence. I mean, they're over a billion dollars just in Kirkland gear. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful thing. It's sort of like, it's sort of the generic brand, but it's also the higher quality. High quality, but low cost. That's As opposed to paying for a logo. Paying I'm, my, for... my family's Middle Eastern. My dad's from Egypt. My mom's from Syria. And so we're very, just a frugal people. And we love a deal. And so we grew up going to Costco. It was like a special treat. And it's still like, if I want it, people are like, what do you do for fun? I go to Costco and I just walk around and see what's on the shelves. That's fun to me. Is your Costco sweatsuit a major aphrodisiac for your wife? I, that has not been the case thus far. That doesn't mean that could change, but so far, she's not impressed. But at the same time, she's never dogged me for it. Like, she's got some, like, fuzzy rainbow Crocs that she got at, like, a Christmas swap, and I think they're horrendous. And so that's, I let her wear those out of comfort, and I wear my Costco swag, and we're very comfortable with that. Do you think the missing piece is the right song? Now, that's a question. What what is the right song? Right, So, so one of these nights... She is that the song? Home. She no, I'm saying oh, she comes was, home. One of these nights. That would have been a good one. She comes home. You've got the slides on. You've got the Kirkland, one, you know, onesie on, sweatsuit on. But the right music is playing. A candle, a yeah. be, some beverages, and your next child is to soon come. I've never thought about this. I think if I looked like Ryan Gosling, I could wear a Kirkland sweatsuit and get away with it. Mm. But in my current juncture, I don't think any any outfit let me just make that very clear would be an aphrodisiac for her now i did we went on a date night i threw in a little suit jacket which has been a while and i feel like she was really impressed yeah not attracted but impressed make that very clear strong well uh as we land the plane i have one uh final question for you uh, actually about your faith and why you look to the Bible for wisdom about finances and life um, but i do want to uh, have you shout out anything we'll put it in the show notes and um, your book, anything else, of course, the YouTube channel, what can people check out? Absolutely. Well, since you know we're on YouTube, uh, subscribe to my channel. We're, we're looking to hit 200,000 in the first year that we've been out, and we're going to hit that if, if these people do the right thing. And so we appreciate that. Check it out. Just search George Camel with a K on YouTube, three videos a week, always trying to entertain and inform at the same time with the Ramsey way as the underpinning. And uh, outside of that, Instagram, George Camel with a K, and then check out the book, Breaking Free from Broke. Um, yes. The feedback has been amazing. People who from 22 to 52 have been like, thank you for giving me hope that it's not too late for me. Thank you for showing me a way that's not full of traps and distractions. It's just a peaceful, confident way to break free from this toxic money matrix and build wealth. Well, I love that. And you know, in these mom- final moments of the podcast, it's kind of a, a pivot, but one of the things I talk a lot about is my faith. And we were just connecting before this. Anna, you spoke at a church recently. Yes. And you you were speaking on uh, how the Bible informs your view on finances. And I would imagine in life, why, why do you look to the Bible for wisdom? Well, we, you know, as a person of faith, we look at it for wisdom in so many other areas. You know, when it comes to our marriage, for example, with relationships, um, of course, with our spiritual walk. And when it comes to money, the Bible has so much to say. 
2,300 scriptures about wealth and possessions and money. And at the same time, it's so aligned. When you look across the book, uh, of course, Proverbs is the book of wisdom, and it's got tons of money wisdom in there. But it's amazing to see the, not only the alignment in the Bible across it, but the alignment with the current culture that we're seeing. You know, Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. I'm like, he was talking about crypto before crypto was even around. Like, wealth gained hastily will dwindle. If you win the lottery, your life will most likely implode. You're not ready for that level of wealth. We have Proverbs 22, 7, the borrower is slave to the lender. It doesn't say unless you have a 0% interest rate. It just says the borrower is slave to the lender. You don't have full autonomy and agency over your life and your choices when you owe someone else money. So these are the principles that Dave built this place on. And it's easy to go like, yes, I believe that's true because it's in the Bible. But living it out, I find that it's a more peaceful way to live. And so what I talked about at that church was the barriers that are holding us back is a lack of margin, a lack of peace in our life, a lack of contentment, and a lack of generosity. And I think that's the secret sauce when you mix faith and finance is generosity is the antidote to so many of the things that ail us in this world. And we could have more of it if we got control of our money, if we got out of debt, if we were on a budget, we'd have more money to not only give, but also to enjoy and to spend and to save for the future and invest and build wealth and leave an inheritance to our children's children, as Proverbs says. And so I love that underpinning on top of this idea that's wild to the secular world, which is that we're stewards. We are meant to be managers of the wealth that God has given to us. Every ounce of my income, I get to take a 90% cut of, is how I look at it. And 10% goes to you know the local church. And if you want to give to ministries and nonprofits and charities, that's the stuff that has eternal joy and a ripple effect generationally, not the things that I got to buy. My Apple Vision Pro, like it's not coming to the grave with me. And so the impact I can have on my family, my community, all of that, when you get out of debt and build wealth is just, it's mind blowing. And so that to me is the real secret sauce of mixing faith and finance. It gives you so much more purpose behind why we're trying to build wealth. And as I've talked to creators and other finance YouTubers out there, they're doing great work and they're, they're great people with great character, with cool goals, but it's just a chasing after the next million the next five million yeah and like why are you so at peace like you're bro you're broke compared to us you're just a millionaire we're multi-millionaires and i'm like i'm running my race man and i found when i when you try to run someone else's race there is no finish line and i i think the running the race set before us as the bible says is the most powerful thing we can do and if god's given me this wealth to manage i'm gonna do it i'm gonna be faithful with it and uh that to me frees me of the weight of what do i do with money and what's my next step i just go god will put that opportunity in front of me He'll put that vacation in front of us. He'll put that person in front of us. And it's just a different way to live when you have a faith underpinning. George Camel, I appreciate you so much. And it's an honor to get to talk to you right now on the journey to 200, but like the best is yet to come. Your future's so bright, I gotta wear sunglasses. Oh, it's so kind. Well, well, Sean, I've looked up at you for a long time. We've been like, you know, Instagram buddies for a while. And I love the respect and you, you have for this place and the way you're helping people out there. And especially with the faith background, I think that's such an underutilized, underrated piece of, of the brand and business you've created. And I think that's why partially it has blown up. And so I'm proud of you and I hope we get to hang out more. Thank you so much. Think Media Podcast, comment, share, rate, review, wherever you're at. Appreciate you so much. My name is Sean Cannell, your guide to building a profitable YouTube channel. Can't wait to connect with you in a future episode.